Hello, welcome to number six in a series called the COVID Leadership Challenge. I'm John Scott, and this is an INCJ podcast on YouTube. COVID-19 is presenting a unique challenge to frontline services all over the world, not just in health and social sectors, but in criminal justice as well. At INCJ, we wanted to find out how leaders internationally were handling the issues around COVID-19. So we've started a conversation with criminal justice organisations to ask about their experience of the crisis. Our hope is that in sharing answers, we will find solutions and fresh ideas. If you want to follow this series, you'll find it on our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or on Twitter at INTCJ Network. Now, let me introduce three people who together lead the ICPA. Now, that's the International Corrections and Prisons Association. So, welcome to Manon Bisson, Peter Severin, and Hans Maurice. Hello, everybody. Now, um, I think probably you should start by telling us where you're based and what role you have in ICPA. Uh, so if you unmute, uh, because that's probably a good way to make sure we can all hear you. Shall we start with Manon? Uh, tell us where you are and what job you have, Manon. Hi. Um, well, I am based in Canada and working from home uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And I am the executive director at uh, ICPA. Okay. Lovely to see you. Uh, you and I are both early morning, aren't we? The, the others will find out what time of day they are in a moment. So what about Peter next? Thank you, John, and great to be here tonight. Tonight indicates <laughs> I'm actually in uh, Sydney, Australia, as you can see from my background. I am the president of the ICPA, and I'm also the commissioner of Corrective Services New South Wales here in Australia, which is the largest of the uh, jurisdictions uh, in this country when it comes to prisons and probation and parole. And are you at home at the moment or are you in the office? I am at home, but uh, I have been working in the office throughout the pandemic. Um, and fortunately, obviously, given the advantages we have as an island, we are actually, as far as community transmission is concerned, COVID-free uh, in this country. So we are doing considerably better than uh, some other parts of the world. Yeah, and I guess we'd say it's a pretty large island. It is a large island. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> welcome. And Hans, uh, say hello to our listeners. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Hans Mörise. I'm the uh, actual vice president of ICPA. I'm normally based in Brussels. Actually, I'm in France. And I was for 12 years also director general of the Belgian prison service. And together with Peter and Manon and others, we tried to... Uh, let's say, make ICPA better all the time. Now, uh, I want you all to imagine that we're around one coffee table. Now, that's pretty, pretty impossible, not just because of the pandemic, but also because the huge distances that we're covering. But we've got this opportunity, have we not, to reflect about what's been a unique 18 months uh, not just for the ICPA, but for the prison services and the organisations that you represent. And I'm wanting um, to talk a bit uh, about the roles that you have, not just in ICPA, but uh, your day jobs as well. So maybe well, let's start with you, Peter, because... Uh, has it felt like a unique period in your life and what impact has it had upon your day job? Yeah, it certainly felt like a very unique period in my life um, and both from a professional perspective um, doing my day job as well as being the president of ICPA, a global organisation where all of a sudden you weren't actually able to meet in person anymore and we had to resort very quickly to using technology. But from a prison administration perspective, as well as uh, supervising offenders in the community, um, while we had pandemic experience with swine flu and like pandemics, and we had pandemic plans, we really didn't know anything about what this pandemic was going to present us with. So here in Australia, we're very fortunate. We had a very responsive government, uh, and we very quickly moved into 
a quite substantial um, period of um, making sure that we take all the protective measures we could possibly take to keep uh, uh, the pandemic out of our prisons. And uh, indeed, if we would have had to deal with uh, anybody being infected by the virus, uh, then we would have been able to do that in a very responsible way. So in many ways, we were fortunate in this country, but it wasn't just simply because we uh, did anything better than others. It was also because we had really all the various elements that you need coming together, a government that was willing to be very proactive, a service that was very responsive, a community that didn't panic and didn't start to sort of try to undermine the rules. Um, so in many ways, we're very compliant, which is not typically Australian, um, but overall, I think we did very well. I'll leave it to maybe Manon and Hans to talk a little bit more about what ICPA actually did in response to the pandemic. Okay, so let's move to Manon then. Um, uh, how long have you been in your role in the ICPA, Manon? Well, thank you. And in fact, I started as executive director uh, last year in July. Um, so during the pandemic, um, that being said, I was unable to meet uh, the staff, um, my team, board members, uh, colleagues and, and stakeholders. So that was a challenging period to start a new job. And my role, in fact, is to, um, you know, and I'm, I'm responsible of the leadership and the management of the organization, according to the, uh, the strategic direction that, uh, that is set by the ICPA board. So uh, it was brand new for me, and I participated in, in, in the, the, the developing vision and the strategic plan to guide the, uh, the association, as well as to manage the day-to-day -day effective and um, efficient operation um, of the association uh, with my team. And previously, uh, I was working uh, for Correctional uh, Service Canada for more than 25 years, mainly in, in institutions. And um, I started um, as a parole officer and then moved on to become a deputy director for 12 years in, in several men facilities. So um, when I started for ICPA uh, and at the time of the pandemic, um, ICPA responded quite quickly uh, by facilitating a global dialogue. And we worked very closely with the United Nations on, on drugs and crimes, with the World Health Organization, as well as the um, International Committee of the Red Cross, where practical effort and support were made um, to, to see what we can bring to the table and also um, practical engagements. So ICPA created a um, COVID-19 prison task force and um, that comprised representatives from several country, countries with the aim uh, of sharing knowledge and best practices in the field of, of corrections in times of crisis and looking at opportunities. Um, in addition, uh, the central response group that we put in place uh, was also to open the dialogue um, with prison agencies, uh, with their respective regions, assess where assistance might be required and to support the exchange of information between agencies um, and to provide guidance on initiatives uh, undertaken by the association uh, during the uh, COVID-19 threat. Mm. And you can find all those resources, very practical ones, uh, in our ICPA website under the C19 page. Mm. Was it a bit weird, though, starting in such an unusual time? It was, uh, it was stimulating and challenging as um, we could not, I could not rely and even we could not rely on past experiences. Um, so we had to um, adapt, innovate, and, and I think... Um, ICPA was quite agile to, to turn around very quickly. Okay. I, I'm going to ask the other two the same question, but how did you get into corrections in the first place, Manon? Well, I was where um, my background is I'm, I'm having a, a bachelor degree uh, in, uh, in psychology as well as a master in business administration. And uh, I was um, interested in the field of corrections. I, I had a, co a co-worker who was a previous parole officer and during lunch we were talking to each other. So I've applied as my background was well suited for this work. 
and um, and, and started as a parole officer and then moved on uh, moved on to become the deputy director over the years. Yeah. You didn't re- read too many crime thrillers when you were young. No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think we'll find that Hans probably did. Okay, Hans. So. Um, so let's look at your experience from a Belgian perspective. Well, f- first of all, I have to say, I, as a vice president, I'm very lucky to, to be able to work with Peter as a president and, and Manon, and, and we forget also uh, Diane Williams, who the four of us are the executive committee and, and steering, uh, let's say, on a permanent basis, uh, ICPA. I think just like Peter, but he's, he's some longer in, in service than me. I started my career in, in 1985 for, for the Justice Department, first as a criminal investigator for the Public Prosecutor's Office in Brussels, Ghent, and I worked national-wide and, and in Europe. And in and, and the end of the 90s, I became a governor in, in the Ghent prison, brilliant city. You have to visit John once, I think you I did think. before. And, and then, um, and then uh, in 2006, becoming a director general, holding a, a master's degree in criminology and public management. I always was interested in, in working internationally. And I've done that from the start with ICPA. And at that time, uh, I was a board member. And then we shifted to other organizations. And since two years, I'm back. Mm-hmm. So uh, as, as Peter mentioned, and, and also Manon, it is not easy to, to run such an organization virtually. But I have to say we managed well. I think uh, Peter and I, we met physically for the last time, I think Peter, February last year in Penta Hotel when we had the strategic planning meeting. Manon was even not there, so she, she had to plug in. So uh, lucky us to have that experience of dedicated people in the international prisons and, and probation corrections to work together, and and as Manon is saying, it's not easy to do that, but we, we developed a lot of things, and we were going to that deeper, I think, on virtual activities to, to take everything alive. So, yeah, that's what we have done, and it's not easy in Belgium, uh, but um, perhaps like in Australia and in Canada, and, and like you, John, in, in UK Ireland, um, we are lucky to have good connectivity these days, to, to talk to each other on a, on a, on a fluent way, uh, without Zoom, it would be difficult, like yes, but I think we all expect to come back, hopefully, in the next months, next year, to physical uh, contacts again. What are the main changes you've had to make to ICPA, Peter, because of COVID-19? And the main changes, obviously, uh, were that we weren't able to meet in person. So ICPA traditionally has been an organisation where the main event is an international conference that attracts about 600 delegates from up to 75 countries. And we come together at the end of October every year in some part of the world, uh, and that's the forum where really the work is happening. And around that, we've got networks, um, we've got some, some task forces and other activities, but the conference is still the main event uh, on an annual basis. So I'm not having the ability to do that as well as some ancillary conferences that we normally run, one in research, one in technology, for example, um, was a major impact. And we were very unsure how well our organisation would do um, consequently to not being able to have our conference. I have to say, this is now, of course, uh, um, a year, uh, 40 months down the track, we've done exceptionally well. Now we have very quickly, like Manon was saying, moved into a task force combining all the energy and the knowledge and and the wisdom that we could uh, harness around the globe and assisting each other. We have uh, immediately started virtual events um, and we continue to do that. Hans certainly has been very proactive in that space and has done a lot of webinars and more recently a full conference together with some other people. Um, And we're actually going to have our virtual conference this year. So um, last year, we weren't able to do that. We had some, some learning academies, which we continue. So we are really facing a situation where going forward, and we can talk about that uh, in the course, uh, we want to maintain a range of those positive experiences out of all the negatives uh, to actually preserve the ability to communicate in a virtual environment, to bring people together very quickly using Zoom, using other platforms, right through to actual virtual events that are more sophisticated going forward. But, of course, we're mm-hmm. desperately hoping to be able to come back together in 2022 
and have our in-person conference because, again, there's no substitute for uh, an in-person experience. I asked the others how they got into corrections, so I need to ask you the same question. Yes, so I've, uh, I'm sort of one that's worked in four different jurisdictions. I'm originally from Germany. My accent most probably gives me away. I started 40 years ago, almost 41, and uh, came to Australia because my mother is Australian, so it's not all that spectacular. And I worked in three different jurisdictions here in Australia. Um, in Queensland, which is we, we don't have a federal system, we only have state-based systems. Mm. Um, and so in Queensland, which is one of our states, I worked there for almost 14 years. Um, I worked in, uh, in South Australia, where I was the Director General Commissioner, and now I've been here in Sydney, uh, the head of New South Wales Correction, for the last almost nine years. Um, I started off um, doing a degree in social work, but then I became prison officer in the German system. Uh, when I came to Australia, never to go back into uh, corrections ever. Three months later, of course, I was very, very much back, uh, and the rest is uh, history. So, um, yes, I've been I've been a jailer all my life, my working life. Well, uh, it's ob obviously in your blood. So let's. Let's look at what do you think have been the main challenges for prisons during the COVID period? Who would like to answer this? What about you, Hans? Well, the, the main challenge, um, yeah, this is something we have discussed already internally uh, as an ICPA uh, objective. But being from Belgium and Europe, um, we, we have been lucky, and, and I've seen what's happening in Canada and in Australia too, in Manon, and, and Peter can plug in on that. We have been lucky to, to be able some 10 years ago to start looking to modernization uh, from, from some technology issues. And, and in 2013, due to a master planning in Belgium, we were able to be a kind of a front runner to change all kind of, of technology access for, for inmates. And today we can say this has saved a lot of troubles um, as, as, in, as in Europe, we had different, let's say, vague uh, tsunamis of, of, of COVID. And the first and the second one, we survived quite well. You know, we could keep it outside of, of prisons. But thanks to technology, now for the last seven, eight months, climate has stayed quite comfortable. You know, every, every inmate has a telephone on a cell, every inmate. We had uh, access rooms for WebEx and Teams to have visits by distance that made it uh, possible to communicate. And the third big advantage in prisons was the telemedicine, which came into it. Mm -hmm. So we saw some, some, let's say, resistance really went away very fast. New mechanisms came into workflow. And I think this will be, and Peter can maybe more actively uh, answer to that, that will be for us the, the main thing to, to streamline that. Because when we come back to normality, I'd say, I don't think this year and not even next year, probably from 2023 complete, but that will then show how parts of the world like Australia, Europe, Canada, North America, and, and we have to wait, of course, for the other parts, how they will deal with, with sustainable changes. Because one thing is for sure, John, we will not go back to what it was before. Mm. Okay, I'm happy to um, Peter next. <laughs> yeah, um, just imagine uh, now from one week to another, there are total restrictions in place. Our prisoners cannot move freely, uh, even within the prison, uh, no visits, um, and a lot of important measures. Uh, wearing of PPE and, and those type of things. There's a significant impact. Um, and I'll highlight two things. Uh, Hans already spoke about technology, and uh, it's absolutely true. The speed with which technology all of a sudden was able to be rolled out, um, and there was no political objection to any of that, was fantastic, and we'll keep that. Just one statistic. We've run in this state, we've got about 13,000 400 prisoners. Um, we've run about 280,000 video visits uh, since the pandemic started. So that's quite significant. And the anecdotes you hear about um, all after a sudden, um, now the prisoners being able to see their dogs 
being able to see the bedrooms of their children, those type of things, or indeed those who come from overseas. And we do have uh, obviously foreign prisoners in our system who were never able to even be on the telephone can now have a video visit with their loved ones wherever they are um, in the world. From an administrator's perspective, what was also really important was that we had the legislative ability to act very quickly. So I could have, in my particular situation, discharged prisoners who would have been vulnerable if the pandemic indeed uh, got a foothold into our prisons. We were very fortunate, but we were prepared. Um, I had legislation that allowed me to simply uh, go from in-court appearances to virtual court appearances in every single occasion. Previously, we had a lot of virtual court appearances, but they were limited uh, to short mentions and those type of things. Now we can do trials via video conference if uh, the parties agree to do that, and the court certainly did. That's actually also been a very positive experience, and I have to say the courts reacted quite differently to what you normally uh, experience with courts who are, um, are very particular about their independence and what that means. So having significant restrictions in place and responding to it flexibly, um, but also ensuring that the workforce didn't resort to any kind of, of um, spontaneous reaction because of fear of uh, not being exposed to the virus, etc., was really a challenge, but also an achievement certainly in this country and I have, I now in, in most other countries, regardless of how the pandemic actually impacted. Um, and it certainly did impact in, in some countries quite significantly. Mm. Manon, can we perhaps think about how different countries have been affected? Because we've heard um, from Peter about Australia, which in, in many ways had managed to stay isolated but uh, there have been countries where uh, COVID had got into the prison population. And my guess is some of your members have had very tough times in a prison setting. Um, have you had members share those experiences with you? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, indeed. I mean, obviously those countries were, you know, they were uh, those prisons and correctional services that were overcrowded. Um, so th it was difficult for them to medically isolate immediately those positive cases. So that was adding to the challenge. Um, all sometimes not being able to stop the, uh, the inflow or the intake and the transfers of inmates um, to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, also, I, I would I would mainly talk for maybe Canada, which I have a little bit more experience since I was new for ICP. But I know that in Canada and the United States, um, they faced positive cases among staff and offenders, and are still dealing with. And these correctional services establish integrated risk management framework to guide their facilities to resume interventions, programs uh, for offenders and uh, services while keeping um, their um, everyone safe. So it was um, developed obviously in, co in collaboration with uh, public health authorities, uh, stakeholders, labor uh, partners uh, to establish the mitigation uh, strategies for each activity. And the framework, what I would say, I think the challenge also was to how you manage institution having staff facing staff shortage while you still have to, to meet your legal obligations and mandate um, by providing, let's say for Canada, the they, um, CSC has a, a legislated as a legal obligation to provide healthcare to the inmate, um, the essential uh, healthcare to inmates. So uh, this was um, a challenge if you're facing a staff shortage. And this was, uh, I think the same process uh, all over the world and would point us to how you can handle some some countries had better uh, measures that they were able to put in place. Uh, we've seen uh, you know some started developing their own protective equipment. Uh, social distancing might be more difficult in some countries than others. Um, so that's that was a reality. It was quite different. Yeah, I mean we have mentioned how hard it must be for prisoners to be separated from their families <laughs> at this time. Um, but also, 
uh, my guess is that in poorer countries where um, the there isn't such good access to technology, uh, you can't use IT to overcome some of the barriers. So uh, I think there's a poverty or countries which are not as well developed. Uh, uh, imprisonment must be three or four times more difficult to uh, during these uh, times of COVID. Now, uh, particularly, uh, for example, in India, which must be experiencing the most dreadful ravages at the moment. Have you got any feedback about how their system is coping at the moment? I might uh, respond to that. So at the moment in India, it is obviously very dire. It's, it's, it's seriously bad. Interestingly enough, when the pandemic started, uh, the Indian system coped relatively well. They had COVID in their prisons. They did all the things that we all did. You know, they locked down. Uh, I'm not talking about single cell lockdown. We're talking about you know, locking the prison down from the outside, no visits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they were able to uh, contain it at a rate of lower infection than in the community. And that's an interesting phenomenon right across the globe, actually, that largely the infection rate in prisons was lower than that in the corresponding community, which is actually a sign that obviously social distancing, if you in some instances enforce it, um, uh, where overcrowding is an issue, that's a different story, um, but it does make a difference. However, now it is seriously challenging because India is going through a period where they can't even look after their general population and looking after the prisoner population is even more challenging. Um, so the, um, the international support that goes out to India from but mainly the Commonwealth countries and uh, of nations, obviously, um, in the first instance, uh, does focus on, on uh, the general population, but the UNIDC and the, the WHO and ICRC uh, also really focusing on the prison population of the disadvantaged uh, parts of the community. We also had some very dramatic um, experiences in parts of Latin America, ICPA, continued to support the effort there, uh, just to sharing information, sharing resources, sharing knowledge and ideas. And that really helped. Uh, if you go to the ICPA website, you'll find an endless source of um, things that we pull together from everywhere in the world that people can easily access and uh, uh, use for their, their own um, system. So, um, certainly in developing countries and countries like like India, uh, it has been very different to, to the experience we had in most part of the developed world. It's a, a really powerful point you make there about the concept of a community where international colleagues can provide uh, intellectual resources as well as support. Um, there is something dreadful though isn't there about how the pandemic makes a difficult job even harder and i'm wondering whether the staff have been uh required additional support i mean i'm thinking of the well-being of prison officers who uh in a way are locked down in many ways with the uh, prisoners as well has there been an increase in mental health issues for staff who clearly been having to manage their own health and risk just as much as the prisoners? Is, is that an issue across the prisons in different countries? Who wants to answer? Uh, I think Peter, who would like to take that up? Okay. Um, it is and it isn't. So there's an interesting phenomenon because life didn't change much for a prison officer going to work. You can't manage prisons on Zoom. You can't do a lockdown using a tablet. So you actually go to your workplace 
And in many ways, that's been a mitigating factor in the context of your mental health well-being. However, as we all have experienced in our communities, the pandemic had an impact on your general well-being because of the fact that you weren't able to socialise, the fact that you weren't able to communicate in person, homeschooling for those families that have got children. Um, so in the context of prisons, that's been exacerbated, particularly in countries where there was a prevalence of um, COVID in the prisons because you haven't got a choice. You know, you can't actually, unless you don't want to go to work, in which case your job will come to an end at some stage, um, you really have to expose yourself to the risk of being infected. So the, um, the focus on the mental health and well-being of staff, um, as it would have been in other industries, uh, has been strong, but it is mitigated by two factors. One is it is actually an industry that did go out of business, so prisons actually continue to operate, now, not like some other parts of the economy that experience high levels of in, like spontaneous unemployment, um, and the fact that your life, may, in terms of your working life, um, the routines were not too upset by the pandemic because you just went to work to do your shift, came home. However, um, that clearly is also, uh, now that, that effect is offset by the general effect that we experience in the communities generally. Okay, let me just move this can, conversation. something. Uh, okay, Hans, yes, please add some. Yeah, just, Peter, because you, you don't suffer from that, I think, too much in Australia, but in, in a lot of European uh, jurisdictions, this COVID reduced uh, overcrowding, you know, and and you mentioned it before, and, and John will be interested in that. Um, there was a shift from, from prisons to probation. A lot of prisoners were, were allowed to go earlier back to society, uh, without too much formality. And, and you noticed well, after one year, some research started to investigate this. And you saw there was not too many incidents, frankly. So this was a really uh, something, uh, a paradox that people got out of prison a little bit earlier than, than, than they should be without the whole process. And in fact, they were really uh, accepted well and probation did a very good job. The only thing we, we suffered from uh, related to, to the business was all things around education and vocational training was really under pressure. This was really something which touched the, the population very hard. In terms of uh, staff, Peter, uh, custodial staff, like you say, custodial staff has to operate. Non-custodial staff, due to the good connectivity, social workers, psychologists, and other stakeholders were able to, to connect by Zoom, Teams, or WebEx. So that went um, quite well. But finally, to maintain, let's say, a good climate, and, and I'm the lucky one, three days ago, I got my first shot, but since two weeks, only since two weeks, all staff of Belgian prisons has now get under a flow of vaccination uh, to be as soon as possible vaccinated. I think in Australia or in Canada, it might have happened already. But this calmed down really now for everybody, the stress and, and figures are going down fast now. And we hope to get by uh, early June to a very quite normal life again. So normalization from society will also, let's say, be for nearly 100% back, let's hope, by the early June. And I think for the main part of Europe, it's the same. Mm. Let's ask about what the lasting impact of COVID-19 will be on practice in prisons. Um, do you think things will go back to the way they were when that normality that Hans was talking about will return? Manon, do you think things will go back to being the same? Uh, I would say not totally, because I think we introduced and embraced a new technology and the benefit of using technology. Um, I think some of the work, teleworking as well uh, for those countries that were able to afford to having, you know, people working from home at distance. Um, this is something that, that probably will remain or will look at. However, we still need um, staff and uh, in institutions or correctional services and prisons to, to deal with offenders and manage offenders and provide the interventions and the programs that um, their legal mandate um, uh, force us to do. So um, I think 
Um, it's a change, a paradigm shift, I would say, because the people uh, will need to go back to working where it won't be as the, back to the new normal or the normal we used to know. Uh, and I think we could benefit from using from the technology and uh, this is for sure. Peter can, can finish this, this session, but I think with, with ICPA, we will try really to develop activities and then to some, uh, some, some workshops, conferences or whatever, webinars, to contribute to what will happen uh, after that. I think prisons, renovation, new prisons planning and design will not be the same as Manon said, technology will really change, game change, but also probation. I think the use of apps, uh, all kind of new systems, electronic monitoring is really going fast to a new kind of technology to help inmates. And I think this will be an impact. And for the next year, there will be a lot of research and we will work together with researchers on that and uh, and I think this will be important for the for the next years mm -hmm. coming up. But I think Peter can 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 really have some contribution to this one. Actually, I might start sort of from the beginning. You know, when this all kicked off, um, uh, there was a very strong feeling that inertia will basically mean that once it's all over, which will be sooner rather than later, we'll just go back to the way it always was, and how wrong we were. Uh, um, so we always talked about it in the context of a response followed by recovery, followed by reform. And um, we responded, I think, as a global community, really well and effective everywhere in the world to the pandemic in prisons. The recovery is um, a little bit more challenging because that also includes vaccination programs, and we're in the middle of that. At the same time, the reform is what Hans was talking about, Manon was talking about, and we spoke about a bit earlier. And that is really maintaining those things that are important to be retained because they're positive learnings out of this. And um, it, it really comes through through um, the learnings that we made in the context of communication, using not telecommunication, sorry, using technology to facilitate communication but also from an ICPA perspective, communicating as a global organization in a very non-global physical way through using technology to connect us globally. So technology is the most obvious one, but I'd like to think, um, like Hans was saying before, that we also learn something, and interestingly enough, some countries in my region here, Indonesia and others, are actually looking at that very, very seriously. Now, the fact that we actually reduced our prison stock, the fact that we let people go out um, uh, because of risk earlier, and the fact that that didn't result in chaos and in crime rates going through the roof, teaches us a lesson in relation to um, uh, using prison in a different way. And so Indonesia, for example, is going to legislate uh, or continue to legislate some of these mechanisms going forward, which is very good because it literally acknowledges that uh, the, the, the pandemic has taught us that we can actually decarcerate to some extent without increasing the risk to the community when we do that. Um, so I personally hope that that will be an experience that uh, a number of jurisdictions will make and will continue to embrace going forward. So there are lessons for the whole system, um, which uh, not just for the prisons, but also for legislators. I'm also interested uh, in a way that uh, Hans highlighted how uh, the regime in prisons has been less uh, rich because education and group work and that sort of contribution to the way that prisons are run has had to be cut down because of uh, the pandemic. So what you've missed has also been seen to be important. Um, I'm wanting to move again now to think about the three of you and your role as leaders. So what have you learned as leaders from the crisis? Let's perhaps start with Hans. What do you think... Uh, leadership well, issues have been? You know, uh, I'm, I'm now 37 years in, in the Justice Department and I've seen different crises, John. And, and uh, I do it with, with, with my earlier uh, years in, in, for the public prosecutors 
this one, this crisis has been really disruptive. And, and it will something that will have an, uh, well, some influence for the next years because we, we know that we might have next year a third shot vaccination. So that means that for next year, it still be there somewhere. But we, we have to be keen on, on change. And, and I think lucky us that there is ICPA. And, and I know there are other organizations worldwide who are also there because we will need to share knowledge. It's also one of the teams this year for our conference and ICPA share knowledge. And because you can't find out the warm water again, you know, this is something which is so overwhelming. And Peter as an active commissioner will, will certainly confirm it. And I think Manon has the same impression from Canada. It will be uh, for the next years really important to, to, to really work together and, uh, and to have the opportunities well-focused not to mistake, not to make mistakes, but really to do what needs to be done. And it's about leadership. And I think an organization as ICPA wants to contribute to leadership to make it uh, happen and, and to, to avoid troubles again, wherever it is. Okay, Manon, lessons for leadership? Yes, I, I think for me also, I would say as a leader in a, in a new business, um, moving from the public sector to uh, the uh, a nonprofit association. Um, I think that without the capacity to meet um, my staff, the executive committee, the board members, uh, program committee members and stakeholders, I think the, um, the challenge was to build virtual relationship and partnership. And this, uh, this is what we're saying. This is very important for an association. And um, it was also my, my challenge was to provide direct directions and guidance um, in an ever-changing uh, reality while entering the wellness and well-being uh, of my staff that is uh, located in different countries. So I needed to ensure having regular meetings with them to make sure we build the team spirit and open up the communication channel. Um, I would say for ICPA in general, uh, I think to maintain our activities uh, we needed to change our work method, moving from in-person to virtual event. ICPA had to innovate uh, and adapt to meet our objectives uh, of an enhancing cooperation and um, exchange of good practices um, in the field of corrections uh, between its members being public, uh, private, and voluntary uh, people as sectors. So ICPA, as briefly mentioned, saw the opportunity to uh, offer to its global corrections community a rich diverse and unique learning experience by launching the le an online learning academy um, in November. And four sessions were held uh, in 2020 um, that garnered more than 345 participants from 34 countries uh, where attendees um, could learn through um, a program of lecture presentations and uh, interactive exchanges. And more sessions will be held uh, in, in this June and over the year. And also as this part, I think we needed to bear in mind that as an international association, we, um, where, where our attendees come from around the world, um, we needed to pay special attention, attention to different time zones uh, to maximize life participation. So this is something that was also challenging uh, when developing virtual events, and, and we paid careful attention to this. Um, and this also, um, as Peter briefly mentioned, and Hans, um, our recent virtual technology and corrections conference uh, considered this important um, aspect in the program about time zones. And when we're going to do, we now are also uh, in the middle of getting ready for our annual conference uh, in October, which will also be done virtually using a new platform. So ICPA will continue, uh, obviously, to offer a virtual event using a new platform that enables um, participants to interact, exchange, and discuss issues. And um, we also have like a digital infrastructure projects that is under progress right now uh, for the replacement of all existing base application uh, used by ICPA for the management of our daily um, business. And it also includes the replacement of ICPA website, um, which will introduce new functionality and this will help uh, pursuing our activities. 
Okay, right. Leadership perspective from you, Peter. Uh, what what have you learned from the crisis as a leader? I mean, I think the first thing I I have to say that I've learned is do just not rely on what you know. Um, this has challenged us in ways that certainly I could never anticipate. So the things that I knew were, yes, maybe a foundation, but now more than that. Um, it was more important, I guess, than in most situations that I've experienced to be as a leader very clear uh, and focus on the purpose uh, of what uh, you want to achieve um, and to be very clear about uh, you know, how to actually achieve that in a way that people can trust that you take their welfare into consideration while at the same time you actually uh, continue to provide, in our case, community safety and security. And then I think Hans mentioned it, uh, you have to be open for change. You know, you just need to um, really embrace the fact that the things you know are not the only things they are. And change is absolutely inevitable, as we always talk about and know. But when it comes to the crunch, this pandemic has really taught us that unless we're actually willing to embrace change and are open to uh, to change, we will not be effective as leaders. Um, so that sounds a little bit mother Buddhist, but I think there's uh, a lot of um, truth in it. The last comment there is what I've experienced is uh, as a leader it is again also really able and be able and possible to just also admit when you don't know something. You know, when you actually seek for solutions yourself rather than try to doctor up some solutions uh, that um, uh, may or may not hold water. So, um, yeah, that's just the cool sort of brief summary from my experience. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it, that the, the word lockdown, which is uh, all across societies around the world has been used, is a term that comes from the prison sector. And I'm going to end uh, this uh, conversation by asking whether societal lockdown has changed you as a person. So, Hans, do you think this very unique period uh, in our lives has changed you as a person? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a unique period. Uh, saying that I'm changed, well... Depends on maturity in life, John. I think younger people have suffered maybe more. But I can't deny that, for example, uh, terraces has been open now since, since a few weeks in Belgium and in France. You can also go now to the, to the local cafe again. But that's, on the, on, the, on the other hand, that's personal. I think professionally, um, we, we kept well, I think, due to, let's say, mutual knowledge of each other since 20 years it was constructed, ICPA. This has helped us as a person for me, I think, um, well, I, I'm, I'm a, maybe an old crocodile, old fashioned. I know what it is to be isolated. I, I was, I have been everywhere in the world and I did even, and I Peter the love it. I did my military service far away from my home in, in West Germany at the time. I was all also isolated uh, from home. No, I just say that we, we just have to take um, care for each other. And and, 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 and and it was maybe good to bring a bit, I know it's a wrong world today, but what I learned, discipline is not a word that you should forget. Because because of discipline, it was in Australia like this, it was everywhere like this, things went back to normal. And maybe we should remember this for the next coming years, that discipline in the way you behave uh, for all kinds of things could help us for in, in staying healthy. And for the rest, I think, well, um, I hope it's nearly forgotten and going back to normal and looking forward to see Peter again. And I've never seen Manon. So normally we should see when it happens next year, probably somewhere. And I think a lot of people, that's what I learned. Uh, even if that virtual thing has went as helping us to the system from, from this COVID, people wants to see each other at the bar again to, to do something informally set up. And that will bring back normality, I hope, soon. Mm -hmm. Has lockdown changed you as a person, Manon? 
Um, for sure. I mean, I think um, I realized even more the importance of of maintaining physical um, and mental health um, and finding a work life balance. And I think, you know, we're we're spending so much time working from home, staring at the screen, working on computers. And I think it's it, it's even more important to go outside and exercise, you know, and I'm looking in that I, in, in Canada, I mean, we have a lot of lockdowns and curfews. And now I'm, I'm, I'm seeing more people going out, exercising, walking. And I think that's a good health, um, you know, practice and, and routines. I think that will remain. And I think it's also true for as a professional, as a leader and as a person. And that's something we need to be careful of. Mm-hmm. Peter? What about you? What have you learned in lockdown? We were obviously very fortunate in my part of the world that lockdown was um, a very short period of time. In Sydney, we had about six weeks, uh, and I wasn't affected by that because uh, as a prison service, I was exempt for not, I was able to go to the office and we worked from the office all the time. Um, and uh, so in that regard, we hadn't, didn't have to go through the experiences that Mama and Hans were just uh, describing. Personally, um, again, I, I think it's really important that uh, realisation for me, just don't take it for granted. You know, we, we do a service, we do it well at the best of times. Um, yes, we always under challenge. And uh, that's, I'm talking about being a prison administrator here. Um, but now the uncertainty of, of uh, or the unpredictability of what might lie around the corner is certainly a lesson that I've learned to not underestimate. And um, so while we haven't had that effect uh, that the European colleagues have and the North American colleagues have in other parts of the world of lockdown, um, Certainly, it's, uh, you know, looking at it globally, but also looking at it here. Um, just don't take it for granted. And um, now again, as I said, be very clear about your purpose, what you want to achieve personally and professionally. Um, and uh, let's hope that we will all be able to, you know, like Hans said, stand at the bar and have a, have a drink. Um, uh, at the moment, I can do that. We're allowed to go to bars and have drinks. But uh, I would love to do that with my colleagues from ICPR. Yes, but being envious of Australians is something that uh, us British are very used to. Um, we're going to sign off shortly, but I wondered if you'd got a word of advice for your uh, prison colleagues around the world to say, uh, to sign off with. Uh, Manon, do you have any uh, advice you'd like to give your colleagues? Um. I think um, it is important to continue the communication, uh, to communicate very well um, <clears throat> uh, with all, I think, the, the stakeholders, um, be it prisoners, staff, um, family relatives of prisoners, um, or uh, any other stakeholders um, mainly in times of the pandemic. It's very important. And since um, we, you know, most, well, some jurisdictions and and correctional services and prisons hand some preparedness plan, um, maybe to review them because we we're not with we had some risk management plan, but I think when they were not ready or enough detailed um, according to what we faced and the reality. So maybe um, to review them according to the lessons learned, where we can make them more um, develop and build uh, updated according to the reality that would be uh, also interesting. Thank you. Lots of wisdom in that. Hans, what's your uh, advice? Same as Manon, just communicate. There is somewhere always a solution available and nobody will keep it hidden from each other. I think this has proven that collaboration and, and sharing is really the best thing to do. And I think that should be the, 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 the bottom word for the next uh, years coming up to and, and to share knowledge. And, and that's the thing we should do. And the last word to the president? Oh, thank you very much. I would like to actually thank uh, correctional staff, administrators, leaders, uh, officers, non-custodial staff for the amazing work they've done. Uh, I've been nothing but impressed, and our task force has highlighted a lot of that, and um, as have our, our webinars. And in many ways, we've attracted more attention of staff who normally would not be able 
to actually make it to one of our conferences. So I think they've done an outstanding job, as have many, many other people in society. But obviously, I'm more than, than pleased to be able to single out uh, on this occasion our correctional colleagues right across the globe. Keep it up. And um, uh, I think we uh, are not at the end of this journey yet, but I think we've come a long, long way and we could have done a lot worse than we have. Um, and keep supporting each other. And if ICPA can do anything to support uh, anybody out there in, in corrections land, uh, we're more than happy to do that. So, And thank you, John, so much for the opportunity to engage in this dialogue. Well, to the people on the front line who perhaps don't get the recognition they deserve, uh, you know, the president of ICPA is saying, a very big thank you, and I'd like to echo that as we sign off from INCJ. Thank you very much for listening. Please stay safe, and I hope that you can join us next time. Uh, goodbye, everyone, and can I remind you that our podcasts are available on your no normal provider, whether that's with iTunes or Google, under INCJ Podcasts. Goodbye. <laughs>